Hi, this is David Otan from Costa La Feliz. Grace to you and peace in the name of Jesus. This video is our study number four, School of Christian Parenting, fourth part, Practical Discipline. In the first video in this series, we spoke about teaching children basic spirituality, helping them experience the power and love of Jesus and live connected to him from an early age. Then, the second part of the series was on creating an atmosphere of love and affirmation that allows them to develop all of their God-given potential. We spoke about being careful with the words we use and about reflecting God's perfect love that casts out all fear. Finally, in the last video, we spoke about healthy discipline that is of God and is not based on punishment nor on fear, but rather on empowering children to bring them up in light of our new covenant in Jesus, according to the gospel of His grace. Today, we're going to continue along the same line and give some suggestions and ideas of how to put all this into practice. Now, many of the concepts in this video and the previous one are taken from this book here by Danny Silk, Loving Our Kids on Purpose. You can find more information on the book in the video description. I highly recommend it. It also contains some really funny stories. But let's continue. If we combine the two final texts from our last video, Ephesians 6.4 and Colossians 3.21, it says the following, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In other words, there is a discipline of the Lord that doesn't provoke anger, nor exasperates, nor causes our children to lose heart. Let's take a moment to review. It's not about provoking them to rebellion by exasperating them or disheartening them. Rather, it is about teaching them to listen to and follow Jesus. Isn't that the true essence of Christian life? It's not about wielding power over them. Remember that picture of the tank? It's not about crushing others in a show of power. Rather, it is about empowering them, helping them to grow. It's not about controlling them, trying to get them to do what I want. Rather, it is about teaching them self-control, training them to manage their freedom with responsibility and wisdom. It's not about having well-behaved children who only do what's expected of them. Rather, it's about having children who change the world for Jesus and His kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. Isn't that our dream for our kids? And finally, it's not about fear nor about punishment. Rather, it is about teaching them to value their relationships with others, to value and protect their heart connection with us, with their siblings, and with other people close to them. Jesus spoke about this very thing when he was asked what was the most important commandment in all Scripture, in all the Bible. Jesus answered, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. It seems that God is more interested in our love and friendship than in us being good people. Of course, when we live connected to Jesus, He transforms us into increasingly better people, people who are more like Him. But that is only a secondary effect. The most important thing is to simply love God, isn't it? In the same way, the goal isn't for the child to learn to be good in order to avoid punishment, but rather that they learn, one, to value their connection, their relationship with others, and two, to make amends and restore this connection when it is damaged. So how much do the kids value their connection with me? Do I value my relationship with them more than their obedience? Good question, isn't it? Now, obeying God is also important. Please don't get me wrong. Jesus himself said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. If a person truly loves God, they will also obey him. 
because doing what is wrong damages our intimacy with him, right? Why do we follow Jesus? Because we're afraid of punishment or out of love? That is the question. It's the same with our children. Perhaps when they are still small, we can control them through punishment and fear. But what are you going to do when they grow older? You can't govern a teenager using rules. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Your influence over a teenager grows or diminishes depending on how much they value their connection with you, right? And if our power struggles have damaged this connection, then they won't care how their decisions affect you. If we spent their entire life trying to impose our will upon theirs, like that tank crushing the car, then they will be exasperated, disheartened, hurt, resentful, to the point that they no longer value their connection with us, and they no longer care how their bad decisions affect us. Have you ever met any teenagers like that? Or maybe you were one yourself. Jesus can still heal you. Please watch the video about the four steps to process our wounds with Jesus. Moving on though, Galatians 6 5 says, For each one will bear his own load. This is the first step in empowering others. Ensure that each person takes responsibility for their own problems. However, if I try to solve someone else's problem, I'm really telling them, This problem isn't yours, it's mine. But there is only one Savior, Jesus. Therefore, the first priority isn't to clean up the mess, but rather to clarify whom does this problem belong to. Now, how do I know if the problem belongs to me? By asking myself, if I sit here and do nothing, will anything bad happen to me personally? If the house is on fire, that is my problem as well. If I don't run outside, I'm going to get burned. However, if my child has failed a class or left their homework at their grandparents' house, is that my problem or the child's problem? And there I need to learn to say, this is your problem. How do you think you could solve it? We're not responsible for solving our children's problems, nor the problems of anyone else, for that matter. We are simply their helpers. So, how are you doing with that? Do you tend to try to solve your children's problems? Or is it easy for you to remember that these are their problems and that you are merely a helper, an advisor, or a coach? Proverbs 19.20 in the New International Version says, Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. This is the attitude we want to see in our children, right? Now, for that to happen, there are three things they need to discover for themselves. One, their bad decisions can cause them pain because of the hurt they then receive from others or from losing something valuable or through having a rough time or whatever. Now, this pain is what will motivate them to change their behavior in the future. In other words, our goal is not to remove nor reduce this pain, but rather to use it for their learning process. Two, they are capable of creating solutions for their problems, they themselves. Three, we, their parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, or teachers, are sources of wisdom and support at their disposal. That is our job. Agreed? Now, all this is good and well, but how do we put it into practice? As we saw in our last video, Jesus said, Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. In the kingdom of God, the greatest person isn't the one who grabs all the power for themselves, but rather the one who gives power to others, the one who lifts up and serves others. It's the attitude that says, I don't control you, but I do control myself or at least I'm trying to. It's a mindset that says, depending on what you decide, I will do this or that. I'm not going to force you to eat your carrots, but if you decide not to eat them now, know that I'm not going to serve you dessert. So, it's up to you. That is the strategy of options. 
Once I was chatting with one of my friends in a park while his two young boys were playing nearby. Suddenly, the dad shouted to one of them, Hey, don't go near your brother with that stick. So guess what the child did? Exactly, he went and poked his little brother with a stick, who promptly started screaming and crying. Now, since I felt we were close enough friends, I said to him later, You do realize that you were the one who caused that scene to happen, right? He looked at me surprised. I said to him, You made the child choose between doing something good, but at the same time bowing his head and giving up power, on the one hand, and doing something bad but feeling powerful, on the other hand. In other words, you made him choose between being good and being powerful. The child chose to be powerful. Perhaps he even chose wisely. At this point, my friend looked at me even more surprised. Maybe it would have been wiser to give the boy the option of being good and being powerful at the same time. What do you think? For example, my friend could have said, Which do you prefer, to keep playing with the stick away from your little brother, or to come and give me the stick and then go play with your brother? That is the strategy of providing options. For it to work well, you'll need to bear in mind three principles. One, all of the options should be good ones. Don't do what my friend did and give them a bad option as well, because almost for sure that is where they'll want to go. Two, clarify the expectations of every option. What does each one consist of exactly? Three, reinforce the options with consequences, like the previous example with the carrots. Of course, what we shouldn't do is present one option as punishment. Do it right now or I'll take away your smartphone. Those are not both good options. Now, all of this is really an art. Only practice makes perfect. No parent is going to do this perfectly well from the outside. It's a matter of taking time every now and then to reflect on how we're doing at this and trying to improve in the future. Once a friend asked me for my advice on how to deal with her 12-year-old daughter, who all of a sudden had started failing her classes at school. They had tried to motivate her and punish her, and it was only producing more and more heated arguments. I suggested that she sit down with her daughter and the latest report card and ask her, How are we to understand what you're telling us through these falling grades? Are you saying that you're not able to maintain a good study discipline on your own because of all the distractions of your phone, your tablet, the TV, your friends? Are you asking us to help you remove some of these distractions? Or is there some other matter you would like us to know about? Please help us listen to you better. That is the issue. The problem isn't the mothers, rather it's the daughters. The mother is there to advise and support her daughter, but it's the daughter who has to make the decisions to solve her problem, right? Another aspect of teaching children to value their heart connection with us is the concept of being pleasant company. Ephesians 4.32 and the New International Version says, Be kind and compassionate to one another. In other words, we should develop kindness and empathy in dealing with other people. Apart from teaching this to our children through our own example, perhaps the concept of pleasant company might be helpful when they're having some kind of tantrum. We do need to give them space to express any legitimate emotion, of course. But sometimes children try to take advantage of that and manipulate us in some way. You know what I mean, don't you? The idea is to teach them the following. If you want to spend time with me, you have to be pleasant company. And this, the tantrum, isn't very pleasant. So are you going to be pleasant or are you going to your room? And if they don't react, do you want to make the call or should I? And if they still don't respond, do you want to walk there on your own or should I carry you in my arms? I hope you noticed that I was always providing two options where both were good, by the way. Later, when they already know how all of this works, I can simply ask them, pleasant or your room? Now, what does this achieve? Two things. 
One, we are teaching them self-control. It's okay to be sad or angry, but they don't have to allow their feelings to dominate them. They can learn to manage their emotions without losing control. Two, we are teaching them to respect other people. It's not only a matter of what the child is feeling, they also have to take into account how their actions affect other people. They need to learn empathy. Well, I think that's enough for today. We've reviewed the concept of healthy discipline and the importance of valuing, above all, our loving relationship with other people. Then we spoke about not solving our children's problems for them, but rather serving them as advisors and helpers and teaching them to create their own solutions. We also spoke about empowering by giving them options. And finally, the concept of being pleasant company to teach them self-control and respect for others. So, what stood out to you most from today's video? What is Jesus challenging you to do or to try? When will you take your next step? Lord Jesus, thank you for your love and for sharing your power and authority with me. Help me to listen to your voice today and to know what I can do now to be more like you to the children in my life. Amen. We'll end here. Thanks for watching this video. If you found it helpful, give it a like and share it or write something in the comment section, please. The next video will be the fifth part of the School of Christian Parenting, Case Studies. We're going to look at three different scenarios and see how we would handle each one, first using a punishment strategy and then from the perspective of healthy discipline as well. In other words, we'll look at how to apply everything that we've learned so far in these more or less common situations. Now, for maximum benefit, first you'll need to download the worksheets from the link in the description of the next video and work through them before watching it. The best way to do that would be in a group or with your spouse or, why not, with the whole family. So subscribe and stay tuned to the channel. Okay, let me leave you with a final prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for the person watching this video. May they be strengthened with power by the Holy Spirit from their innermost being. May they know beyond all doubt that your Son, Jesus, lives in their heart. May they comprehend today a little more of the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of the love of Jesus that surpasses knowledge. And may they be filled up to all the fullness of our God. Amen.